record. Awesome. We are now recording. Thanks everybody who's joining and uh, folks that we've got from outside of our region. We have a special guest today. I'm going to let him introduce himself in a moment. We also have some teams joining from outside the region. I was recently added to a Teams in Command Facebook group. Uh, big thanks to, I think it was Katie, uh, for the massive love that you gave me there. Uh, and so I shared that link, this link for this meeting in there as well. Okay, so without further ado, let's get into the slides. Can everybody see my slides? Thumbs up. Somebody give me a thumbs up. Perfect. Thank you, Jules. Okay. So today we're gonna to talk about Teams in Command. We're gonna talk about opportunities. Every Wednesday, this time, this bat channel, we talk about Teams, we do it in a group setting. Um, those of you who've joined before, you're gonna see my Zoom rules in a minute and they'll be familiar to you and you'll be like, oh, she's doing it again. Those of you who are new to this, they'll be new to you, maybe, depending on how many Teams trainings uh, you typically join. Those of you who are absolutely new to training with me, some of those rules might make you feel uncomfortable. I'm gonna tell you right now, this is a really super safe space. Okay, so my name is Kelly Finnegan. I am the regional tech trainer for the Carolinas. Prior to this role, I was an MCA in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, which is where I'm based for a little over two years. I am actively licensed. I'm not active in production anymore. Always looking to build my referral network and referral pipeline. That's where uh, my passive income comes from these days. This is a great opportunity, especially since we've branched outside of the region now for you guys to get to know each other. So in a moment, you're gonna see a rule for my Zooms that is gonna be really important for you guys, especially if you're outside of North Carolina. Um, okay, so I'm gonna stop talking for a minute and let Gilles introduce himself yeah. a super special guest today. <laughs> All right, thanks, uh, Kelly. Uh, my name is Jill, I'm from Montreal, so you will remember me forever be because of my accent, right? So it's obvious. So um, I'm not going to take too long. Just that to tell you that. Contact and brevity. Okay. That's okay. Just I'll to tell you that. Yep. Okay. Go ahead. Got it. Uh, all right. So I've built my career uh, based on two. I've, I've built a couple of businesses, very very uh, successful businesses. Uh, the first one was in telecommunications, so call centers, uh, where we started from scratch, from two guys in a basement, and we grew it up to about 100 employees. And then we sold it to Cisco in 2006. With that money, I started another venture, this time in real estate technology. And believe it or not, that started that in 2009, I didn't even know what the MLS letters stood for. <laughs> so I've, I've come a long way over these years and started this business in Canada and it was the equivalent of Dot Loop. Dot Loop didn't even, was not even known to us in Canada. And I sold that company two and a half years ago, and we had uh, 130,000 agents in Canada. We had about 40,000 of them using our system. So it was electronic signature, document management, et cetera, transaction management. So in those two companies, I was responsible for sales and business dev. So when I saw opportunities in command, I said, wow, this is my baby. I love this because as a business and as a team, uh, leader, I, I needed to know and to have full visibility on my business at any given time. So, and that's what opportunity brings to you. So that's where I am. That's how I ended up in, uh, in real estate. And two and a half years ago, when I was just about to go and play golf and have some fun, uh, one of my clients, actually, uh, Keller Williams OP, reached out and said, Jill, do you know anyone who would know about Canada? real estate technology and this and this and that. And I said, I know a lot of people. Well, a week later, I, when I looked at the requirements, I said, well, it's, it's only one guy who can do this. It's me. But I, you know, I'm not an employee. I'm not, I have no interest. I'm a builder. I'm an entrepreneur, just like you guys. I like challenges. So I talked with the KWRI team in Austin. I fell in love with them. And I said, okay, let's have some fun. So I'm having some fun working with amazing people like Kelly and the other regional tech uh, trainers, it's, it's just mind blowing. And to see how, where command started two and a half years ago, where it's at, where it's at now, just incredible. So it's back to you, Kelly. That, that was a little bit about me. Thank you, Gilles. Uh, we really appreciate you being here and your experience. 
And just so you guys know, uh, it's not just when Jill speaks French, which I love. Um, <laughs> you're based just outside of Montreal, yes? That's correct, three okay. minutes. Yes, so it's not just that. Um, Jill is an expert in all things command. And when I've got a PySync question, he's the one I go to. When I post in our RTT Slack, he is one of the first to always respond. Um, super smart guy, so we're really lucky to have him today. Thank you, but uh, okay, I'll give you your 20 bucks. I'll send it to you. I'm I'll a fan. 20 bucks. <laughs> Thanks. I'm a fan. I don't need any money. That's good. <laughs> okay. okay, so Zoom rules. So those of you who've never been on a Zoom with me, because I know we've got some folks outside of the region, um, I'll go through these. I'm going to go through them pretty quickly because those who have joined before are going to be like, oh, I've heard these before. So first and foremost, please go into the chat right now and say hello and where you're from. This is gonna allow you guys to connect with each other. This is about building connections and relationships and networks across the regions. I do want you to use your mute liberally. Occasionally, if I hear background noise, I'm gonna mute you just cause. If you're still kind of figuring out Zoom, if the last thing you touched was mute, you can press and hold your space bar and it will unmute you and mute you. I have no problem you guys unmuting when you have questions. Interrupt me, it doesn't bother me. I don't think it's gonna bother Gilles because I interrupt him all the time on our RTT calls. Um, he's actually a hell of a lot more patient than everybody else <laughs> around that. I do want you to turn on your cameras, you guys. This is really important. We're not in a room together and I promise you're gorgeous. It doesn't matter what you look like. If you've got a camera on your computer or on your phone, please turn it on. It's so much more personal experience that way. Also, please feel free to post questions in the chat. I've got, I see at least one Market Center Tech trainer in here. Katie, I'm gonna call on you to check out that chat and holler at me if you see something. Anybody else who's been on these before, Jenna, I'm gonna call you out. If you see a question in there and I don't see it, thank you, Katie, um, and I don't see it, please do unmute and call it out to me so I don't, nobody gets lost in the mix here. Also, this is an open and positive space. All technology causes frustration. It's inevitable. It's also inevitable that if we do any demos today, we're gonna to encounter problems. I'll come to my cute little piggy in a moment. So this is not where we complain, you guys. This is where we look for solutions. We're gonna be solution-oriented, we're gonna be open-minded and learning-based. And then if you see someone post an idea or I ask you guys to share your experience on certain questions, please do share. Unmute yourself and share. It's really important. So here comes my piggy. Those of you who've been on this before know that it's inevitable that technology frustrates us. And when that happens, we're gonna say, we were not gonna get frustrated. So this is the point where I say, Jenna's already doing it. Everybody on this call now has to say, we, I'm not moving until you do. Come on y'all. Yeah, I see you, Jeffrey, thank you. <laughs> Perfect, okay. You guys are such good trainers and trainees. I love it. All right. 24 seven uh, resources available to you. So at some point you're gonna have a problem. It happens to all of us. Um, I wanna make sure you know where you can get 24 seven support. Your market center tech trainers and each of your market centers are phenomenal. Half of them are volunteers, you guys, and they're running their own businesses. Reach out to them. If they're not available, maybe they're helping somebody else or maybe it's like 11 o'clock at night and you're laying in bed watching Marty Miller videos and trying to do it and it's not working. Here are places you can go. My favorites from this slide are actually answers.kw.com. I look at it every day, you guys. I've looked at it 14 times today already looking for something. Did someone ask me something or I wanted to make sure, did something change? These days, Paul Polanski's so amazing. Every time something new launches, he's already got an article teed up and it goes on to answers.kw.com. If you click something and it doesn't work the way you think it should or you notice that something isn't there. Ideas.kw.com is also your friend. We're super fortunate. We work for a company that it, this entire platform is about keeping us as the fiduciary and making sure that it is by agents for agents. Ideas is where you go to add new ideas or to vote up ideas that are already there. So those are my favorites. The other thing I'll go ahead and mention is two things. One, Marty Miller just launched Command 66 Day Challenge 4.0. If you're not watching them, go watch them. They're phenomenal. As an MCA, I learned command watching Marty Miller's videos laying in bed at night. That's how I learned it because I couldn't do it during the day. So they're phenomenal. It's a great resource. The other thing that's not on here is command your database, you guys. It's a new Facebook group created by Shannon Dager. She's an RTT 
somewhere, Ohio maybe. Um, she'll be really mad at me that I don't remember that at the moment, but um, people go into that face group, Facebook group and they share smart plans with each other. KW culture is to give and receive, give more than you get. You're always gonna get more than you give as long as you're giving. Okay, also this session is being recorded and will get uploaded to my YouTube channel. Thanks to you guys, I now have enough subscribers that I can actually name it, which is kind of cool. Uh, never thought I'd be YouTube famous. I don't think I qualify as that yet. However, um, what you can always count on is that I'm gonna tell you guys the truth here. Um, I believe in KW, I believe in everything it stands for, and uh, I'm a realist. So if you ask me a question and it's not there yet or there's a bug happening, I'm gonna be real honest with you. And you'll find that in all of my videos. Okay, so it wouldn't be a training and a tech training if I didn't start with the model. Today we're gonna talk about opportunities which is really all about the sales pipeline section. So you've already converted a contact to a lead, created an opportunity, or better yet, you still have a lead. They've given you some measure of criteria that makes it so they become an opportunity in your pipeline, which might be, if they're a lead still, so you're still having a one-way conversation with them. However, they've put a timeline on it. Even if that timeline is four years out, you guys, they still belong in your pipeline. If you want to retire three years from now and you got all the stuff in your pipeline, it's a lot easier to sell your book of business if they're already there. If they're not there and you have no real proof that they exist, it's super hard to sell that book of business. Uh, Julie Youngblood at Family Reunion said something I love. She said that no lead sucks. The timeline that you're willing to put people in your pipeline is the timeline you're willing to be a real estate agent or that you're willing to sell a book of business to another agent. So consider that. So we're gonna focus on that piece right there. These are people who are already in your pipeline. A key differentiator between command as the platform with several interconnected applets and many other CRMs out there today is that the contact and the opportunity are separate. I talk to a lot of teams every day, you guys who are like, we just wanna be able to add notes to the contact card. Like, okay, there's a, there is a way to do that. However, if it's notes about the transaction, it really belongs in the opportunity notes, not necessarily the contact notes. So I wanna make sure that you guys remember this. And I guarantee from all the times I've done this, a question is gonna come up where I'm gonna say that belongs in the opportunity. It and might Kelly, be this training, it might be another one. Yes? If I may, this is, this is so important because I've used systems like Infusionsoft and Salesforce in the past and other big CRMs and all the notes related to transactions and to separate deals had to live right in the contact profile, becoming a huge mess. What I love about command is the fact that these are separated and the notes relevant to a certain, to a specific transaction live within that transaction. So it's clean, it's organized, it's the best. So that is super important. Yes, yes. And if so you're in North Carolina, and you get that brown, the dreaded brown envelope from the commission, having everything in one place with your opportunities really helps you. Not having to go to multiple places is exactly what you want, you guys. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna switch you guys between Rainmaker and team member because we're talking teams here. So some of you may be Rainmaker, some of you may log in as your Rainmaker because you're in an ops position and some of you are gonna be team members. So I'm definitely gonna switch back and forth when I'm talking about Rainmaker settings, I'm gonna make that super clear. It's important that team members understand them as well. Whether you're in, in an operations role that supports your team member or a team member, you need to understand the implications of all of these settings. So first and foremost, one of the team settings that is inside the Rainmaker account, so we're gonna log in as the Rainmaker, we either are the Rainmaker or we're logging in as them. We're gonna click the Rainmaker's name at the top or the little carrot, that little arrow, beside it, we're gonna go into settings and we're gonna to navigate to the opportunity settings section. I wanna make sure and point this out, you guys, because it has moved around a little bit. We had a section in there called sales pipeline. It's now all buried under opportunity. So every day, every week, guys, we get a little bit of cleanup, we get some enhancements, we get some bug fixes. This is one of those kind of cleanup options where they were like, hey, it doesn't make sense to make it separate. The thing I wanna point out here is that what you can see on my screen, this is all about whether or not a team member can create individual pipelines versus having to put everything on the team pipeline. 
if you select no here as a rainmaker or an ops person working on behalf of the rainmaker, that means that every time they create an opportunity, they have no choice but to put it onto the team pipeline. I'm gonna tell you guys right now, this is my recommendation across the board. And here's why. Every deal they do is going to roll up to the team maker from a production standpoint anyway. That's how it works in the win more system, which drives all of our profit share, which drives all of the data underlying this massive platform. That's how it works anyway. I get teams who say to me, well, we have some exceptions. And so I'm gonna pretend for a moment, I'm gonna pick um, Jenna. You're gonna be my rainmaker and I'm gonna be your buyer's agent. And you and I have an agreement where if it's my family or friends or people that I have come into our team relationship as owning, right? And should I ever leave our team or leave KW, they're still mine. Like my mom is always gonna be mine. My dad's always gonna be mine. And we agree to that. However, if I do a deal with my mom or my dad, they're still going to roll up to the team pipeline. So there's no reason that they can't go on the team pipeline. If we have a separate split agreement or we have a separate agreement about how the contacts are owned, because these are separate applets, interconnected, but separate, that's okay. They can still roll up to the pipeline. So I generally recommend across the board, you guys, that you, your rainmakers or your operations people logging in as the rainmaker, go into this and set it to no, period. It will make everything easier in the long run from an insights and accountability standpoint. And if you're allowing specific team members, so let's say you chose select agents here and picked a couple of team members that you allow to create their own, you're, you're encountering the possibility that when they create that opportunity, they don't actually select the team and then they can't fix it later. You guys, it's not editable. They will have to archive it and start over again. And that causes frustration and irritation across the board. I see it all the time, you guys. So I would really strongly consider select no. No. <laughs> I, I always recommend selecting no. On all the teams that I've trained so far, only one has selected yes, because that's the way they operate. That's it. Uh, also a little trick here. If you're the rainmaker and logging into command and going to settings, and you're not seeing some of these options go back at the top and select your team these options will then show up because if you don't select the team you won't see those options right? excellent it's point Jill. Yes, happens to me all the you. time <laughs> yes i appreciate that because a lot of times people will go in and they'll only see what an individual agent will see and it's because they've not selected the team in the top horizontal navigation and that actually got left out of my image um, i appreciate that thank you Okay, so no is the recommendation. Team access, so we're, again, remember that contacts and transactions are separate. Team stages and checklists cascade down to all opportunities on the team pipeline. So here's what I wanna make sure you guys understand, that when you log in as the Rainmaker and any of the edits that you make to the stages and checklists on the Rainmaker's pipeline will actually cascade down. So some of you might be thinking, well, why would I do that? Why do I want um, the same stages and checklists across all pipelines? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Number one, you may want a continuity of service across this, your team members. Number two, it makes things a lot cleaner for assigning them checklist items to all of your team members because they can be assigned. When you're creating those stages and checklists, you're creating a default system that cascades down to all of your team members. So every single team owned opportunity, again, that relies on that no, or someone remembering to select the team, is gonna follow the same continuity as the entire team. Now, does that mean that they can't do some things that are special? Of course they can. However, it means at a minimum, everybody's gonna follow a baseline of service. And it means you're working smarter, not harder. So I'm gonna be honest with you guys, I'm a little lazy. I don't wanna have to rework all the time. I want to do it one time and have it everywhere. And so every time I build out a training document, it's all about thinking, okay, if I'm lazy, maybe someone else is. Maybe someone else needs a checklist that they need to remember. And as a rainmaker or an operations person, you'll get to see whether or not all of those activities are actually happening. I also want you guys to get super tag happy. You can filter by tags in your all opportunities view. And there's lots of ways that people are using tags. I'm gonna come back to that in a moment. 
Um, you can add one or all of your team members as assignees on a given opportunity. So let's say you've got, I'm gonna go back to my example earlier. Jenna's gonna continue to be my rainmaker. I'm gonna be her buyer's agent. Um, and we have, let's say Gilles is going to be our transaction coordinator on all the deals. So when I create an opportunity, it's gonna be team owned. Jenna as my rainmaker is gonna be the owner of it. I'm automatically gonna be added as an assignee because I created it. And I'm gonna add Gilles to it as well because I wanna make sure that Gilles has access to all of the details and the room. Yeah, and uh, Kelly, if mm -hmm. I may, if you, if you are in a multiple rainmaker situation, make sure that the other rainmakers are also added as a signee because when you're going to sync with your DocuSign room, you want to give to, that information to sync as well. So Absolutely. if you are in a multiple rainmakers situation, make sure everybody's assigned. So I'm going to tag onto that for a minute. In um, and this is going to apply for North Carolina. I'm not precisely sure how it works in South Carolina and outside of our region. In North Carolina, we have a uh, dual agency and designated dual agency. As a team, so Jenna is my rainmaker. She's listed a property. I am the buyer's agent. I'm representing the buyer and my buyer is going to buy her listing. I am not going to add Jenna as an assignee on that deal because what I don't want is Jenna in my room. Because we are practicing dual designation, I need a wall between us. I need Jenna to not see anything that might be considered proprietary or confidential. And I don't want her to have leverage information over my client. I want to win because I'm KW. I'm looking for a win-win solution. However, I want to win. And I don't want to get that brown envelope. If you're practicing dual agency, uh, it's not... Um, it's not as important that Jenna is not added as an assignee uh, because you are practicing dual and it's expected that you're not being a zealous advocate. However, you're, you're taking on more of a mediator role. So you need to look at what your team agreements are, what your brokerage agreements are. Some brokerages do not allow dual designation within a team. You need to be aware of that and be clear about that. Anyone that is noted as an assignee is gonna have access to that room and all of the details. Everyone on the team will see the base They'll see the opportunity in the base details, but they will not be able to get into anything that's potentially uh, confidential. So I, guys, I want you guys to be really clear about that and understand the difference so that you don't risk a compliance. Um, um, you may risk an audit no matter what, because we, we can't stop people from complaining. I want you to make sure you don't get in trouble. Okay, and the last thing is, just like Jill said a moment ago, you're gonna add assignees, you're gonna start that transaction. If you notice that all of your assignees have not been added to the room, don't worry about it. Click sync transaction. It's gonna sync all the details. If you've already created it and created your room and then added an assignee, or then added the um, details for the property. So on a buy deal, I don't have a property address right away. I'm gonna add that in later. I might link to a listing or I may manually add it, at any time you can click sync transaction and it's gonna move those details over. Super important, you guys, if you're using DocuSign, the sync transaction button is your friend. It is gonna take all the details and push them into the details tab of DocuSign. And that matters because every time you open a contract, it's gonna to try to autofill with anything on the details tab inside your room. Lazy girl wants you to work smarter, not harder. Okay, so, Tagging opportunities. This is where I told you guys. Oh yeah, Jenna. We, we have a couple questions. Please bring them on. Okay. So back to where you were um, telling us yes or no in regards to the. Um, yep, yeah, I see you getting there. I know. Um, there we go. <laughs> so Kevin Hall said that if I think that my one agent who was an early adopter cannot see his existing opportunities, is there a workaround for that? Okay, he can uh, see he them should, yeah. yeah, in all opportunities. So when if you click that now, right, because a lot of people who started early, um, some of the rules I've described did not exist initially. If you click that, anything that was on his individual pipeline, you're right. When he goes into opportunities, he's not going to be able to see it. Not in the beautiful pipeline view where you see listings and buyers and, and leases. However, if he clicks all opportunities, he will absolutely see them. He will not lose them. He just won't be able to see them in that pipeline view because the rules have changed, right? The rules of the game have changed a little. 
Okay, and then the second question is, in regards to assigning um, and the dual agency situation. Okay. So say the person has assigned the rainmaker, but mm -hmm. then it's gonna end up being a dual agency. Can they just easily remove that assignee and problem is solved? Or what's um, the I think it's there? probably gonna be a two-step process. I think A, they're gonna have to remove the assignee on the opportunity details. And when you bring up, when you click edit, I'm pretty sure you can X that out. And I think they're going to have to go into the DocuSign room and remove them from the people tab as well. Yeah. You're correct, Kelly. Yep. That's it. Oh, thank you, Jenna. I appreciate you. Um, okay. All right. So I'm going to keep going. So we're going to go back to tagging. Um, so anyone who actually watched the live stream yesterday with Marty and I, um, so cool to be on a live stream with Marty, the 66 day challenge guy himself. I felt very famous for like 10 seconds. Um, until I realized how smart he is and how not smart I am in comparison. Um, we did talk about tagging for teams, uh, specifically around opportunity tagging. So I'd like to hear you guys unmute and tell me, are you using, if you're using opportunity tags, what are you using them for? How are you leveraging that today? I'll go, Kelly. Um, so awesome. we use our, our opportunity tags. We use them very limited, um, and we just do what kind of property they're doing. So whether it's resale, new construction, land, investment, um, that kind of situation. Um, that's kind of all we use our opportunity tags for, though, right now. Okay, cool. And so when you go into the all opportunities, you can actually filter by that tag, and then you could copy and paste, or you could export it into a report. So how many times have you wondered or been asked, where did your business come from last year? If you add those tags, you can actually filter by your entire opportunity pipeline that way. And you can get a really clear idea if it's type, like property type, like resale, land, vacant lot, um, residential versus commercial, then you would be able to filter that way. Is there anyone else who's using opportunity tags in a different way? Um, yes, I do that one as well, um, whether it's land and that kind of thing, but I also do like where the referrals are coming from. Mm -hmm. So whether it's another agent or Zillow or Homelight or wherever the leads are coming from, that's also one. Um, and then I also use our actual agents as tags, just because visually for the eye, those tags come up first. And it's just easier for me when I look at the cards to see quickly who it belongs to. I love that. So you are leveraging the tags, not necessarily from a filtering standpoint, but from a visual standpoint, understanding that when you look at that pipeline and you dig into say the cultivate phase, you can see at a glance who's is who's. Absolutely. Love it. And Jenna also mentioned source. So knowing that whether it was a paid lead or a paid lead Zillow or an agent referral, or a past client referral. Um, these are great to understand the source of your business and where your business landed. The other thing Marty and I had talked about was price points. So I've worked with a lot of agents who work at that sort of churn and burn price point. Um, there's a couple of agents in Chapel Hill that I'm still pushing really hard to raise their price point because I want them to work smarter, not harder. I want them to do less and make more. And I know that that resonates with them. So I've gotten them to start tagging their opportunities with a price bracket so they could see how many deals I'm doing at that particular price point. Uh, Gilles, can you think of any other opportunity tags you've heard people using? Well, no, when I teach, I always teach my people to think about two ways of using the tags. Nurturing in your cultivate phase. So they need to tag in order to be able to sort and focus on the opportunities that would that should bring you know not money the, the quickest and the second set of tags is for managing the opportunities for the admin people right so filtering sorting uh, what do i have to do today what are the things that i should focus on today because there are not too many sorting features in the opportunity uh, module so tag is is the way to go awesome yes and, and it depends for on each on each team right uh, because business process is different from one team to another. No, so, uh, but basically two family of tags, one mm -hmm. for your nurturing pipeline and the other one for your managing pipeline once it goes into active and 
and further down the road. I thought of another one this morning as well. When I was looking at our RTT Slack, I saw one of the RTTs had talked about a particular idea that she'd like to see, which is a calendar view of their opportunities. What if you tagged every opportunity the month they're closing? And then you could actually filter out your all our opportunities view by everybody who's closing this month, everybody who's this closing is, next month. This is an idea on idea.com that I've submitted a while back to be able to sort you know, you uh, your, your, your phases by close dates. Mm -hmm. You can't right now. You can in the all opportunities view. You can actually now sort by close date. However, if you were a visual <laughs> person, you could start tagging by the month they, you anticipate they're closing. Yeah. And the, the level of insight that's going to give you is another way. Okay, so we've talked about tags. We've got a lot to cover. I want to keep going. Um, so team customization, things that you can do across. So we talked about this earlier. This is better than a whiteboard, you guys. In a COVID environment, we cannot all stand in front of a whiteboard within six inches of it and six inches of each other anymore. So the pipeline is your view as a rainmaker into your entire team's pipeline, as an operations person on behalf of it, as a rainmaker who wants to coach their team members on what they have going on, what kind of outreach they're doing. This gives you that sort of insight in a very digital way. While the five phases are set, stages and checklists within them are completely customizable. It's your business, your value proposition, your way. So while you're doing it one way, someone right down the hall from you, if you're in an office, is doing it their way. We're all using the same platform in a very customized way. Those checklist items that you create, once you're in an opportunity, you can actually assign them to team members with dates so that those appear in their task list. So now you're actually sharing accountability across the team. Um, and thanks to Gilles earlier, I wanna make sure that everybody understands too that uh, consumer guide, so you create your own version. There's a baseline version of the consumer guide for you on your websites and your app. And you can make that again, customized to your team, how you guys run a deal, whether it's a buyer deal or a seller deal. And if you can get your client, whoever they are, to sign into your website or your app, you now have a way to tell them when each of those stages is complete. So I am certain everybody on here has received that email or that text or that call at 10 o'clock at night from a client. Sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. Sorry, that's my Siri talking to me. This is a great way for you to have constant insight and for them to have a constant insight into the transaction. If you have not yet uh, customized your consumer guides and getting your agents and your clients involved in that, you need to do that. So that when they text you at 11 o'clock at night, you don't have to respond. You can remind them the following morning that they have access at all times to where they are in the transaction. Uh, I've done a pretty thorough analysis of our app and sites versus other apps and sites from other brokerages and uh, franchises. And I can tell you this is one place that we have the edge. No one else has this yet. If you're not using it, use it, you guys. It's scalable, it's automated, and it keeps you from having to respond at 11 o'clock at night. If you're not great yet at setting those expectations with your clients, it's a great way to do that. Jill, you wanna uh, add something? Yeah, um, do you remember I told you that a few years ago, I didn't even know what MLS stood for. Uh, it, I didn't even know what it, the work of an agent was. So I sold about eight houses, but eight houses in my life always with different agents. Fault on them because no one was bothered to, to nurture, uh, nurture me. But the thing that I, I realized is that an agent would come home, make me sign a listing agreement at his price, would go off and then come back with a, with a, for a showing or two, and then would convince me to sell at his price. And then I would see him at the lawyer and make him a big check. What the hell? This is an easy job. Right? <laughs> so I, I wanted to become a real estate agent because this guy's doing nothing. Only when I started uh, Next One, uh, my real estate technology company, along the way I learned what all of what you guys are doing. It's impressive. But you know what? None of your clients know it. They don't know what you're doing in the back end. They just see you once in a while. And then they, what stick to their mind is, I'm giving you a big check. They just don't know the big job you're doing. 
So there's a feature that's coming. I don't know if you're going to talk about it or it's yeah. a time to talk about it. Yes. There's a feature coming next month. It was supposed to be released a few weeks ago, but they're working on a team uh, feature and it's called client updates. So when you build your checklist, you are now going to add items for which you want your client to be informed. And as you admin uh, manage your, your checklist and you say, this item has now been completed, the next day, the client is going to receive an email with a summary of all the things that you've done the previous day. You're keeping them in emotional proximity of yourself. Think about that. Wow, this is amazing. They're doing this. I didn't know they were doing all of these work, all of these, all of these things. So you're not going to get that call at 11 at night because the next day, they're going to get an email saying, well, this has been done, that task has been done, and so on. And you can send those updates on behalf of the agent within the team or on behalf of the team. So but we'll, we'll, Kelly was going to have a, a chance to teach you on that when, it, when it's released. But it's amazing. I find this is some teams are paying CRMs three or $4,000 a month to get that specific feature. Right. So uh, I'm excited yes. about that. This is totally about automation. So I, I went ahead in the slides. I love that, Jill. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so this is coming soon. We don't do dates, right? We say soon ish. Uh, July ish, August ish. No, it's August ish. <laughs> right. Right. So it, and it may well be August ish. It may be more like Mega Camp ish. Um, because uh, as you guys know, Keller Williams has two proms every year. That's our prom, right? We've got family reunion and got mega camp. So we build all these things and like we launch them and then we watch everybody break it and we fix it. So one of the things that's coming is this client update. And so it's going to be really important. And we're mentioning it to you guys because it's kind of like when I've talked about the team tag service that's coming. I want you to be ready when it comes. I want you to know how it's going to work. And I want you to be ready to pull that trigger because once it launches, it's out there. And you either set it up and you leverage it, or in some cases, you're going to find that you have no choice but to figure out how to navigate in that world. This is one of those that it's not going to automatically turn on. It's going to be set within the Rainmakers account first, and it will cascade down. And it will be a daily time each day that your clients will receive those updates. So you'll set a default when you create those um, stages and checklists. On a default basis, the Rainmaker will be able to say, these are the items that should be appearing on a client update. Within a given opportunity, you could check and uncheck those as well. It's really important here. Um, one of my favorite trainings when I was an active agent was listening to an agent talk about the commission scale. Um, I was one of those agents where I constantly, it's like I had something written on my forehead. Please ask me to discount my commission. Every single appointment I walked in, I was like, why do they keep asking me this? I am worth it. You can create your checklist, A, so that your team is creating um, a continuity of service, and B, so that you are reinforcing that value and the level of work that you as a team are giving your clients all the time. And it, you'll set it up so that it sends it each time, like if it's 12 o'clock every day, everything that was part of that checklist that had the little client update checkbox is going to, and if it got checked off, is going to send to the client saying the, all of these things got done. And you don't, all you have to do is check the boxes, you guys. So if you're not leveraging your stages and your checklists to be custom to your team, you need to do that. If your team or your agents, if you don't have a, like a team where there's multiple people doing um, responsibilities, aren't yet checking off those, there's two problems with that. One is when this launches, they're missing an opportunity to auto email a client, right? It's automated, doesn't require any effort. And two, you're missing an opportunity as the productivity coach on your team or the rainmaker to hold them accountable for doing the same thing all the time. Because it takes a second, you guys, to check off the box. It got done. I talked to lots of teams who are using this at a high level. They get on those coaching calls and they go, I only see three of nine checked off. And the agent says, oh, well, I actually did them. If I'm the rainmaker, if Jenna is my rainmaker, I expect Jenna to say to me, Kelly, that's awesome. I'm really glad to hear that you're staying on top of it. How would I have known that if we didn't talk today? More importantly, if Gilles is going to back you up next week on vacation, how will he know what's been done? And lastly, how does your client know it got done? What trick did you miss there, Kelly? So, 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, yeah, that, so that, that is coming good soon. Points, yeah. Yeah. And, and okay, so coming soon. So get ready, plan ahead. It's 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 always going to be better. And to the consumer guy that you were referencing to before, mm -hmm. make sure that there is cohesion between mm -hmm. your consumer guide and your test item, right? If you're saying in your consumer guide, this is what I'm going to do, this is what your client is going to do, well, make sure that you have some, you know, it's syncing together and they're saying A, B, C in your consumer guide and X, Y, Z in your, in your client updates. It just doesn't make sense, right? Right. So. And if you want your consumer guide not to have 38 steps, right? No. You've got the step called due diligence in North Carolina and here are all the things I'm going to do. In the details section of that step, the step might be called due diligence. Inside the details, you're going to have 37 items that you're going to take care of. Those 37 items can be separate checklist items so that they can see how you're progressing through the 37 without creating 37 individual steps in your consumer guide. Super easy to do it, you guys. It's in the consumer section. Um, Marty Miller's got a video about it. Lots of people have videos these days. It's very easy to do it. You're going to create a universal buyer guide and a universal settings uh, seller guide. You're going to create a set of stages and checklists that are universal across them. And you do wanna make sure there's some alignment there. Because guys, if you're not leveraging the automation of command, you're working harder than you need to. And lazy girl right here is thinking, oh, I'm tired for you. I'm tired for you. I'm happy to come in and you can pay me a whole bunch of money to set this up for you. However, you can do it yourself. That's the really cool thing. Okay, so we talked about um, amending your consumer guides so that they make sense. Inside of each opportunity, if it's a buyer opportunity or a seller opportunity, you're gonna have this new tab called buyer profile. That is where you actually can go in and make those changes to where your client is so that they have constant access into the progression. You're just gonna click manage guide. And when you click manage guide, it's gonna pop up this little window where you can check off those items. And that's gonna check off the items in the consumer guide inside the app when they're logged in or your command IDX website. I know some of you right now are thinking, I have not moved my command IDX website. I don't wanna, I don't like it, I'm not doing it. That's fine. We can take that offline. I can have a conversation with you. And we can talk about how we can build out what you're doing on your website today inside of command. However, you could do it in the app because that's pretty cool. And it's the only app that's got it. Okay. Also discussions. So I've talked to a lot of teams who are using things like Slack or email to stay in contact across all of their team members. Use the discussions, you guys. What's really cool about discussions is it's it works just like slack you can react and create and reply and do all of that and it's all going to stay within the transaction you can add images you can add specific members so i'm going to go back to my earlier example jenna is my rainmaker i am the buyer's agent and Gilles is our transaction coordinator although obviously you guys can see he's far more strategic than a transaction coordinator if <laughs> i need to at Gilles and i've not added him as an assignee he is still going to see that discussion because I added him. If Leanne, Leanne, I can see you, so I'm going to call on you. If Leanne is my marketing director, she does not need to be an assignee because she doesn't need to see anything other than when she knows. She just needs to know when it went live so she can post all of our just listed, when it's gone under contract so she can post under contract in three days, when we went to closing so she can post the picture of my super cool sign with my clients standing outside, and of course they all have masks on and everything cool during COVID, she just needs to know those things. So she doesn't need to be an assignee, she just needs to know when they're happening. I can go into the discussions, I can at Leanne and she can make that happen. Discussions, make it so that everything is happening inside of the opportunity. Again, it's all inside that transaction. It's not in a separate platform that we've gotta go find and figure out and learn and be a part of. It's all in the same one. Discussions are your friends. So this is where I'm gonna pause. Also, when you're added, so in that situation, when I use the at symbol at Leanne, it's gonna notify her in her bell. She's gonna get a Kelly notification. I know someone here is gonna be like, but I need an email. Leanne, I hear you, I feel you. Let's put it up on ideas.kw.com and let's vote it up. We are starting to get more and more email notifications. It's not that hard now. They've built the basics of that functionality. All we have to do is vote it up. 
Is anyone in this group using discussions today? Awesome, Katie. Tell me how you guys are using them. So um, we use them sometimes too for little updates, um, just to where they know, okay, everything's good, you know, on this end. So I do all the back end stuff. So this way I'm not having to call or text the agent constantly. When I'm working in command, I can just send a quick little update that says, hey, FYI, we're clear to close now, you know, moving forward. Um, or if I'm missing something, I like to use it there. So if I notice on paperwork, hey, noticed you're missing initials on your buyer agency, update that for me, let me know when it's done. Um, I like it too, because then it's attached to the opportunity versus me going through my texts, you know, trying to find if I actually asked them that question or not, um, and stuff like that. So we just kind of use it just for the quick little hey need something quick but isn't an emergency type thing um stuff like that so that's how we've been using it i love that and i've definitely heard teams um, and i'm starting to work with a new team where they actually do the compliance review before they submit it to the market center and so they're using the discussions to say it's ready for review so whoever right. does their internal team review first mm -hmm. they at symbol that person to know, okay, it's time for me to go in and take a look at everything they've already uploaded onto the documents tab. Mm -hmm. And if it's good to go, I will click submit to MC for them. If it's not, I'm gonna either add them back or take it offline, like you said, if it's an urgent thing, you're probably gonna text and go, hey, you got a real problem here, man. You forgot yeah. to see this and this, <laughs> and I don't see this document at all, and they're gonna kick it back. Yep. That's awesome. It's a very, very, very efficient communication channel for, every single opportunity and i love the fact you can add pictures when you when you do discussions as well so that yes. can be uh, useful now you can't actually add gifts within it however you could go find a gift download it to your computer and put it in there because i did it the other day i had like the shiloh shiloh you know do it like the weird fiery gift that everybody giggles at and i did that to a couple team members and i was like hey did you see that they're like yeah i did it made me laugh perfect okay so it's definitely doable. Anybody else want to add to that discussions discussion? Nope. Okay. Okay. Um, DocuSign. So everyone added as an assignee will be added to the room. If you don't see it happen the first time, make sure that you click sync transaction and all assignees will be added to the room as well. A couple of things to note here. Um, I'm going to go back to my example. Jenna is my rainmaker. I've added her as an assignee. Because uh, she doesn't currently have any listings, so I'm not worried about dual agency and the, the wall we need between us. Jenna can get into my room. I'm about to go on vacation. I have pulled all the contracts into my room, and I need Jenna to pick up the slack for me while I'm gone. Unfortunately, because I put all those contracts in the room, Jenna cannot edit them as a DocuSign form. However, Jenna can pull it into an envelope and make edits there, whether it's strike through or dragging in new text fields. So only document owners today, and the owner is defined by the person who pulls it into the room, can actually edit them as a DocuSign form. Everyone in the room can edit them in an envelope though. That is going to change. That is one of the things that management has asked for. When I say management, I mean your team leaders and your market center tech trainers have been pushing really hard with KW to make sure that we can get as much functionality in DocuSign as either exists that we can get turned on on our platform or we're actually pushing DocuSign to build new functionality. So we are paving the way for new enhancements with them and this is something that is coming. I can't give you a timeline around it. I actually think that this is one of the ones that is slated for this year though, where if I pull it into the room, Jenna, as long as Jenna has been added as an assignee to that room, to the opportunity, which we sync the transaction and then add it to the room, Jenna will actually be able to edit it as a contract form too. That is coming. For now though, I just wanna make sure you guys understand that nuance. Um, everyone can edit in the envelope, only the document owner can edit as a form. So if there are people on your team who typically work your forms for you, in North Carolina, they need to be licensed. Only licensed individuals may fill out contract forms. So if you've got people who are doing it who are not licensed, don't tell me, I don't wanna know it. Um, I don't, and this is being recorded. You don't want the commission to know it either. Make sure that those are the people pulling it into the room. Um, okay, and then we talked about that. Okay, so let's go through quick best practices and then save some time for questions. All opportunities go on the team pipeline. 
from a production standpoint, that's what happens. So I'm just doing a real quick recap here, you guys, around best practices of what we've discussed. It is best if the rainmaker says no. Gary says it best, man. We've got to learn how to say no. I'll tell you right now, guys, I don't like to say no. I really don't. Uh, however, I'm, I'm, I'm getting better at it in this role. <laughs> You got to learn to say no, and this is the perfect time to start to learn. Uh, adding transaction notes to the opportunity and not the contact card. It is specific to the transaction. It should go in the opportunity. If it is something that will apply to all future transactions with that contact, maybe it's an investor you work with, then fine. You could add that to the contact card as well. Also add it to the opportunity. Use your tags. They are your friend. Right now, you can sort and filter and do all that, and you can have visual representation of whatever the deal is in a way that we heard Jenna talk about earlier. In the future, the reports section where a Rainmaker can go in and look at all of the pipeline are going to be able to pump out reports by whatever tags you've got. So build for that future. Customize your team stages and checklists inside the Rainmaker account so they cascade down. This is working smarter, not harder. Customize your buyer and seller guides. So if the Rainmaker or an operations or marketing person on your team says, this is what all of our buyer and seller guides should look like. You will have to replicate that across each person's site. If they live in a Word document, guys, it's an easy copy and paste. Super easy to do it. Use discussions to talk to team members, both the ones that are assigned and not assigned. Prep your checklists for your client updates because it's coming and you want those to be ready. Use it to keep in constant contact with your client in an automated way and to solidify your value proposition. Because just like Gilles said earlier, they don't know what you do. They don't know what your team does. I'm a realtor. I know it and I still hate the idea of how much is going to someone else at the end of the deal. However, I know what they're worth. I know what you're worth. Other people, they just don't get it. They don't know it. And you gotta use every opportunity you can. And then make sure that those consumer guide steps and those checklist steps that you've checked off for client updates are in alignment. All right, I'm gonna stop talking. I realize we have eight minutes left. I'm also gonna stop sharing and we're gonna open this up for any questions. I'm gonna pull up the chat because I can see there's a bunch in there and let's do questions. All right, I'm gonna start at the bottom. Yeah, so I answered that one. Uh, awesome. Um, yeah. I see that. Jim. So if there are no questions, I have a couple of points I'd like to bring on. Uh, yeah. I don't want to steal your time, guys. It's your time to ask questions. So if you have questions, just, just say shut up and uh, I will. No problem. Wait, uh, before you say it, though, Gilles, I just saw something ahead. in the, the comments that I just wanted to tell everybody. Um, Kevin, you are, if you're still with us, I don't see Kevin in the screen. Oh, yeah, you are. Yeah, yeah he's there. Um, La Jolla, right? So the first time I ever saw a sign for La Jolla, I was nine months pregnant on a business trip and I was in a cab with a bunch of people and I had no idea where we were going. We were in San Diego and I saw the sign and I said, where are we going? And they were like, they pointed at the sign. I went, we're going to La Jolla. <laughs> and everybody <laughs> in the car and the taxi cab driver thought it was the funniest thing you'd ever heard. And they were like, I was like, what's wrong? And they were like, Kelly, you actually do speak Spanish. And I was like, Double L is Joel, because I learned from Chilean, and oh, just too funny. So I'm sorry. Gio, please share. I just thought okay. I saw it. was like, it's such a beautiful place. So gorgeous. That's okay. Absolutely. Uh, one little tip that I might, I might share with you. When you bring your opportunity to the close phase, your checklist in the close phase should have, at the end of your checklist, all the reminders of what you need to do, because the last thing you want to do is, it goes into the close phase and 30 days later, it disappears from the dashboard. And then what's next? Remember that one, one of your client closes a deal, anytime three to five to six to seven years after that, he's gonna transact again with you. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna need to start nurturing that contact again. So I would suggest add a reminder to add this contact on your smart plans maybe your monthly neighborhood smart plan, your quarterly mm -hmm. callback, your quarterly or annual newsletter, stay in touch. If you don't put those reminders, they're gonna go off the screen and you're just gonna forget about them, right? So what I do is sometimes 
uh, what I suggest people is when a deal gets, gets close, closes, have a reminder to create a new opportunity, bring back into the cultivate phase, all right? As a past client, long-term nurture, it's there, it's in your books, like you said at the beginning of the call, Kelly. It's in the books. So you end up having the value of your past clients right there into your, onto your opportunity funnel. So those, I think, are, are keys uh, to remind yourself of what you need to do. I love forward. that, Jill. So, and I'll, I'm going to give you guys an alternative to that, too. So I had noticed that um, things were rolling off the active pipeline. And I get this question all the time. What happened to the things that closed? I still had responsibilities there inside my checklist. Okay, one, they're not gone. They're all available under all opportunities. You can always, always get them there. They, they roll off, you guys, because you don't want 100 things. You don't want 100 cards in that list that you've got to scroll through. So I met with some teams who have now added inside of the um, under contract uh, phase a stage called closing where all of those activities are so that they're doing it like the day of or the day after closing before they actually drag it into the closed uh, because it will roll off of that. Um, the other thing I'll tell you guys is I have I've heard from two different agents recently that they added their so they were they helped the client sell a home and they had moved into um, a rental and they were doing that temporarily for a little while. So one of them moved into a rental, another one moved into another home that they helped them buy. They put them on new monthly neighborhood nurtures right away, the day after. Yeah. One of them put it on the neighborhood they moved into so that they knew their, their neighborhood values and they could watch the value trek ups, right? So the appreciation of their home value. The other one where they said that they were renting for a little while because they were waiting for their kids to, some, I think they were graduating from a graduate school and they were going to move. And so they wanted to move where their kid was going. And so I put them on a monthly neighborhood nurture for neighborhoods in Florida where they were going. The one that had just moved 11 months later came up as a um, last visited. And so the agent reached out to them because they sort their database every day by last visited and said, Hey, I noticed that you were, you were looking at properties. What's going on? And they said, well, my husband just got a new job and we're moving. Wouldn't have known it. You guys, if A, they weren't on the monthly neighborhood nurture and B, part of their daily lead gen was to sort that column or to create a smart view that does it for you to see who's visiting. They would have no idea. They had already reached out to Zillow to get a Zillow offer, cash offer on that home. So she got in the door, talked to them about Keller offers, ended up selling their home and helping them buy the new one. There you go. Really important, you guys. Don't lose that opportunity. Don't create orphans. I saw more of them as an MCA and I would take those numbers in our team meetings and I'd be like, want to know how many orphans y'all created this month? And they hated it. They were like, I don't like it when you show me this. I'm like, well, you need to know that that guy over there is picking up all your orphans. That one right there, that guy. Absolutely. Well, this is the one thing is you showed at the beginning, the MRE model, right? The MRE model teaches us how to nurture our existing database, right? To stay in touch, to be aware of what's going on in their lives so that we can jump in when there's a real estate transaction showing up. Not just chase the hot leads, but nurture your database. And you can do that in opportunities and add those reminders yeah. at home anniversary smart plan. We just bought a house, you, sh you know? These clients should be right away be added to a home anniversary smart plan. Takes a takes well, five seconds. Takes right. no time. Cheapest leads you'll ever get because they're automated. Absolutely, <laughs> they're there. You're amazing, uh, Kelly. No, you're amazing. Everybody, can we get a virtual hug for Gilles? Right, virtual hugs. Come on, virtual hugs. Yay, I'm a serious. I'm a serious hugger. I'm a serious hugger. I'm French, <laughs> so come on. COVID is killing me. <laughs> right, and I think you're like a. On oh, yeah. too, right? Three, yeah. three. Okay. Great. All right. Awesome. All right, you guys, it is 1259. Any last questions? Anybody want to share an aha, something you learned, something you wrote down and were like, oh, I'm going to do this. Anybody want to share something, please? Well, well probably on the uh, consumer guide. That's been an ongoing project for five years every so many months my rainmaker says you know what we need is we need this thing that 
<laughs> and, you know, we're always looking for an outside or some other whiz bang thing. So, um, you know, this, that's, uh, the a number one thing of, of today's training, nice. lots of good stuff, but, but, uh, that I need good. to, to uh, share with him. Good. It's visual. And, and, it's free. Yeah. And to that point, Kevin, I would say plan ahead, make sure that your consumer guides are built appropriately, thinking about the client updates and all these checklists in mind. Why? Because you don't want to keep changing those clients, those consumer guides along the way because it's going to look awful. Remember, when you make a change in real time, it's going to change on the app, right? So uh, you don't want to impact your, your consumer or your clients every day. You're going to say, well, what's this, you know? So, but that's a good point. Awesome. Awesome. Any other ahas, you guys? Anybody learn anything? I did. I did too. I love your idea I about pulling them right back into your pipeline because within seven years, they're going to, they're going to buy again. I love that. That's most likely it will be before seven years these days. Right. Yeah. So I would add, uh, uh, checklist items such as, okay, remember creating a task, even if it's a year down the road or two years down the road, create a task. Okay, that client has, been, has moved two years ago, so it's time to do a market analysis and see the equity on the house, and maybe it's time to engage again with that client. So there's all mm -hmm. kinds of things you can do right in that funnel, in, yeah. that, in that pipeline management. Yeah, I love that. I That's love that. Too. I never even I considered wish that. I wish I had that instead of Salesforce or Infusion stuff, where it took six months to a year just to set it up for our own business. Here you have opportunities already set up for your business. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is tweak, you know, tweak left and right and you're in business. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Okay. Any last questions, you guys? Those of you who've been on my Zooms before know that I'll wait a few seconds, see if anybody unmutes, and then I'll give you the hand. Are you ready? <laughs> Jenna knows where I'm going with this, okay? <laughs> okay. All right, you guys. Have a great day, go crush it. Thank you. Go work time. smart, not hard. Bye everyone, have a good day, yeah. Thank you, Gilles. We really okay, appreciate my pleasure. you, honey. Thanks. Awesome, Bye. you're awesome. You're awesome. <laughs> Bye.